So Stokes' theorem is not exactly a surprise, is it? We've seen that equation before in other contexts. Let's think about it. Let's say that alpha is a k-form field on a domain in Rn. Then in the special case where k equals 1 and n equals 2, what do we have? We have Green's theorem, right? Integrating a one-form field over the boundary of a two-dimensional domain. Got it. But let's keep going. In the case where k equals 2 and n equals 3, well, that's really just Gauss's theorem, isn't it? Right? A two-form field, domain in 3D, yep. In the case where k equals 1, but n equals 3, that is the classical Stokes theorem. Okay, so we've got Green, Gauss, Stokes. Oh, but wait, there was another theorem, a pretty special theorem, the independence of path theorem, that is really the generalized Stokes theorem when k equals 0, and n is whatever, it works in all dimensions. In particular, it works in dimension 1. And that very special case, where k equals 0 and n equals 1, is what? It's the fundamental theorem of integral calculus. All of these are really manifestations of the generalized Stokes theorem. But that one fundamental theorem, that theorem that we learned way back in single variable calculus, is really the key. It's the key to understanding Green's theorem, Gauss's theorem, Stokes' theorem. All of these are really connected in a very deep way to that fundamental theorem. In fact, the fundamental theorem is the key to the proof of the generalized Stokes theorem. Now, we're not going to go into the details of that proof. Rather, what we're going to do is think what the generalized Stokes theorem can tell us about other things. Things like this one question that we've thought about before. Why is it that d squared equals zero? That is, if you take the derivative of a derivative of a form field, you always get zero. We've looked at it from a couple of different ways. We've thought about it in terms of algebra, in terms of geometry. Let's think in terms of Stokes' theorem. This is, this is kind of a weird way to think. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say that alpha is a k minus 2 form field, and d is a k-dimensional domain in R. N. Now, stick with me for a minute. What happens if we take d alpha and integrate it over the boundary of d? Can we do that? Do the dimensions match up? Well, the boundary of d is k minus 1 dimensional. d alpha is a k minus 1 form field. Good. Stokes theorem says that what? Well, instead of integrating the derivative of alpha, we can integrate alpha over what? Over the boundary of what we were integrating over before. So that means that this is equal to the integral of alpha over the boundary of the boundary of d. Okay, well, I, I guess that's one way to think about it. But look, you can go the other way. And you can say that, oh, the integral of this thing over the boundary of d is really the integral of its derivative over the interior of d. And now, chaining these things together, well, something interesting happens, and a deep truth is revealed, a truth that says what Stokes' theorem is really telling you is that the exterior derivative operator, d, and the boundary operator are linked. They're tied together by this operation of integration. And so the idea that d squared equals zero is really connected to the idea that the boundary of a boundary is zero, is, is empty, is something that vanishes. Is that the case? Well, let's take a domain D and apply the boundary operator twice. Maybe you've got a cube in 3D, and you look at its boundary, and then you've got those six faces, right? Now take the boundary of each of those, and I get a whole bunch of edges. Ah, but you have to remember the orientations of those edges. And even though we have a lot of repetition going on, they're all in the opposite direction. And so they cancel. The boundary of a boundary of a cube is empty. And not just a cube, but lots of objects. In fact, anything reasonable that you can write down is going to have this property that when you take the boundary, and then you take the boundary of that, you wind up getting something where whatever you get cancels 
out. You got to be careful with orientations, but it works. And it works at the infinitesimal level. And because it works at the infinitesimal level, you can chain these things up to get it to work in arbitrary, reasonable shapes, the kind of shapes that Stokes' theorem applies to. Okay, now that is kind of weird. That's kind of deep. That's a little difficult to wrap your mind around, but this is what mathematics is all about, is building connections, seeing things from multiple perspectives. Stokes' theorem is so deep and so beautiful and so wonderful. You could spend a lot of time learning some really deep mathematics associated to this. We're not going to go that route. We're going to instead think about what we can use this for, but you should know that you are getting very close to some very beautiful math.